Thank you, Magali. Um, I'm so excited to share the Yellow Boat um, story with you this afternoon. Um, Bonjour. <laughs> um, I, I want to know who came from outside of France. Can you raise your hand? Okay. Um, did you take a plane? Okay. How about a boat? Did anyone take a boat? <laughs> um, because I personally took this boat <laughs> um, starting 15 months ago. And um, I think it's the yellow boat story that, uh, that allowed me to now be uh, invited in TEDx Montpellier. And uh, for me, it's really this yellow boat that um, got me here. So uh, that's what I'm going to share um, with you this afternoon. Um, may I ask, uh, I see that our boat is ready. May I ask everyone to stand up? It's the time of the afternoon again to stretch our legs and exercise, um, including those who are watching online. Um, I hope you all do it. Um, you can jump on board the yellow boat. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You can now sit down. Um, next slide. Um, so. We're now going to, um, this is, uh, I'm not sure if everyone can see it. This is a map of the Philippines. So I came from Manila, which is upper north. Um, we're going 600 kilometers uh, south now to the village called Layag Layag uh, in Sambuanga City. And the yellow boat uh, story started in Sambuanga City. Um, and as you can see, it's a wonderful mangrove village um, called Layag Layag, where the people are mostly seaweed farmers. And they live on houses on stilts because um, during high tide, um, the water really goes up to 10 feet, 15 feet. So they, they have this, um, if you can see the houses, uh, it's quite far in this picture, but um, it's raised 10 feet above the ground um, so that when it's high tide, uh, you know, they can still live in the house. And um, so the story started there. And um, 15 months ago, next slide, uh, I met Nadsky. Um, he's a 12-year-old in elementary school, and he's, uh, he's basically, you know, he's really uh, very interested in going to school, and I was amazed by their story. So as we go along the story, um, think about how much an education is worth for you. Would you walk four kilometers or even eight kilometers just to be able to go to school? Would you, you know, would you walk through mud? Would you walk for 30 minutes or would you walk for three hours? Some of these stories we've heard before. But for Nadsky and his friends, next slide, um, it was really amazing because um, when I went there um, 15 months ago, I learned that they were practically swimming to school. Um, since it's a mangrove village, it's a few kilometers away from the shore of Sambuanga City. They, during high tide, when they go in the morning to school, uh, the water is still high, so they have to practically swim to school. So the story, I actually didn't see it first. It was shared to me. And the people that went in that area that shared to me the story were saying they had their, um, they had their school uniform, and their school supplies, their notebooks, their school bag in a plastic bag, and they were swimming with one hand, and the other hand um, were containing the plastic bag with their things. And then um, while they are doing the swimming, they were talking to each other, this group of children, and when they their left hand gets tired, they put it in the right hand, and they swim with the other hand. So when it was, you know, it was another summit where this story was shared to me, and it really amazed me. I mean, for, for some of the people there, probably they thought it's, you know, it's a bit normal, um, but it really amazed me, and it just floored me. Um, next slide. Um, it really floored me that, you know, there are kids <laughs> to swim to school. We, we sometimes hear of stories um, in Manila and even in other um, key cities in the world. We hear of students sometimes who skip school, so that they can go swimming. <laughs> but here were kids, you know, who went swimming so that they can go to school. So during low tide, um, they going back to their home, they would have to walk through uh, the mud as well and even going to school. So after swimming, they have to walk another half kilometer just to be able to go to school. And going back at home, um, it's low tide already, so they have to walk the two kilometers uh, back to their houses in mud. And so I was really touched. Um, during that summit, I went back the next day to Manila, which is the Philippine capital, and I couldn't shake the story off my mind. 
I mean, I I grew up in Mindanao as well, uh, near Sambuanga City in Cotabato City. But uh, I've heard a lot of stories. Like there are kids in the Philippines who you know walk for three hours one way just to be able to go to school, and going home it's another three hours. But I've never seen, you know, uh, I've never heard of a story where kids were swimming or wading through water just to be able to go to school. So it really, you know, it could I couldn't shake it off my mind and. Um, I wanted to share it with other people and see what we can do for the kids. And so I updated my Facebook status with a two-sentence story. Um, I just came from Sambuanga City, and I heard of this amazing story about kids who were swimming to school. And little did I know that it would become you know, a big project as it is now. And so within, within hours of posting that status, friends reposted it, and then friends of friends repo uh, reposted it as well. So it, it went viral within days. And um, within one week, we had 1,300 euros, which um, we believe was enough to buy them a boat. And so I called on um, mm -hmm. Anton Lim, which is a good friend in Sambuanga City, to look for a boat. But then we realized we couldn't buy a commercial boat because it couldn't maneuver in the mangrove area. Because during low tide, when the water gets so low, it couldn't pass anymore. So the, the bottom of the boat should be flat in, instead of pointed as the commercial boats are. And so we look for a boat maker, which is Abs Mawadi. Um, he's one of the parents as well of the swimming kids. And we convince him <laughs> to build a boat for us that can accommodate 30 kids and also motorize. And so he built the boat. And as you can see, um, it took quite a while um, because he, he was used to making like smaller boats that can just fit six to eight people. And he was, um, he was trying out um, a boat that is now larger and also motorized. And so as you can see, the story started with just being shared to me um, by a few friends and then me posting it on a Facebook status and then the uh, fundraising campaign happened online, and now we were building a boat. And so last March 27, last year, um, we turned over the boat. I went for the first time to the village of Layag Layag, and we turned over the boat, um, the yellow boat. Um, the concept behind that is uh, the school bus that we know in the world is color yellow, <laughs> so because they ferry kids from their home to their school. And so since this is also the same thing, this is uh, uh, ferrying the kids from their homes to the school, so we, called, uh, we colored it yellow, and we called it Bagong Pag-asa, or the English translation is New Hope, because we provided, we believe, you know, a lot of people supported it, and we believe that it is a sign of new hope for the community. But when I went there, I found out that this sort of relationship with the community was just starting because um, I found out that they need other things. Like, you know, they also need healthcare. Um, they also need uh, livelihood opportunities. Because what they're doing now is just doing seaweed farming, but it's not really, you know, there's no science behind it. It's, they, just like, they just plant seaweed and harvest it and sell it to the market. And so every day they struggle, you know, to keep up. And that's why they ki their kids have to go swimming just to be able to go to school. So I realized our work has not stopped there. And so that's why I'm sharing the story now. And then um, we go north, another 300 kilometers. After the success of this first project in Layag Layag, another friend um, from a province called Masbate called me that there are similar kids who swim to school. Now this time from the Mangro village, this time these kids swim 300 meters of open ocean. If you can see, that's open ocean um, in the West Philippine Sea, and they have to cross 300 meters to go to the main island so that they can go to school. It doesn't seem like you know, a far distance, but it is the open ocean. Um, so during typhoons, they couldn't swim um, because the waves are really bad. And so I, I thought at first that the story is unique to one village, which is Layag Layag. And then I realized you know, that we now have two communities. And so we used Facebook again, social media, bloggers blogged about it, wrote about it. Um, photographers took pictures um, and you know a lot of citizen journalists came out of the story and so we build we built more boats for these kids um, this this time it's uh, not motorized because they it's just 300 meters and they come from different 
different parts of the island. And so, as you can see, we've, so far we've given around 100 boats all over the Philippines uh, because we're now helping three communities. And it seems that they really need it. And the wonderful, the wonderful aspect, another wonderful aspect of the project is that they can also use it for their livelihood. So the parents, after bringing their kids to school, can use it to fish or can use it to harvest their seaweeds. So it's sorts of, sort of becoming sustainable in that way. And it made me realize um, that we should continue helping these kids because um, another story that I want to share, the story of Binoy, um, he's uh, in grade two uh, in elementary as well. And before, uh, when he was still swimming to school, he was second honor in class. But after we gave the boat, he became first honor. <laughs> so can you imagine there are kids like them that you know, do not think of the struggles that they have to face to or the challenges uh, in terms of going to school. Um, they don't think about it. They just want to learn. So it's very important for us you know, to highlight their story and help them because that's, I think, their story can really amaze the world and other children in other parts of the world who might have more comfortable lives. And uh, it made me realize that, you know, all it takes to make a difference is a single Facebook status. <laughs> and now, of course, I realize that, you know, it could be one Facebook uh, post, it could be one tweet, um, there are other examples uh, out there, um, one blog post or even a picture. So all it takes, um, because of these digital tools, um, some, some of the other speakers shared about their personal stories um, in healthcare, how it creates a ripple effect um, for the patients um, and for, for the bloggers as well and for the people in Tunisia, how it brought and allowed them you know, to have power to change their country. And so it made me realize that because of all these new technologies, it's now so easy to help other people if we just take the time. And for example, in our um, story, we've been e even able to build a school so they no longer need to go to the main island. And can you imagine it all started from a Facebook status to one yellow boat, which I thought was enough, and then we realized there are more kids who swim to school. And so you can see the yellow boats <laughs> uh, beneath the, in the shore, and then you can see at the top of the hill there's a, there's a school. Um, never in my life uh, growing up I, uh, did I expect that, you know, a single Facebook status or even one little act, ah, you know, can result to a lot of boats and then to even a school. Um, and so it really made me realize that the yellow boat is sort of a symbol. And that's why I continue to share it with other organizations. And I'm thankful that I'm here with you um, today because I believe the yellow boat stands for hope. And if we go back in the olden times, I'm sure you remember the old man who also people thought was crazy in building a big boat. <laughs> uh, and then a great flood came, and <laughs> it was the, that boat that saved um, a lot of people and you know, a lot of animals in the world. Um, it could be a myth, but um, it's really there. And especially with what's happening now with climate change, a lot of floods are happening in the Philippines, uh, in even in other uh, European and um, in even in North America, there are um, floods that are happening in places where there's usually no flood. And so I think we need boats. <laughs> we need more boats. Um, but let me share with you what I learned throughout this whole process. And um, we Filipinos love acronyms. I'm not sure if the French <laughs> love acronyms, but we love giving you know, meaning to, to some words. So for me, I was before I left the Philippines, I was thinking, how can I share, how can we make hope actionable? H how can I, you know, uh, di dissect its elements? And so it made me realize that H stands for harnessing your passion or harnessing your potential. Um, my, my, one of my passions in life is really using social media. It could be for business. Um, before that, I was using it in government. Um, and then because of this project, I'm now saying I'm using it for social media, for social change. Uh, and so I believe, you know, because of these tools, it allows us now to harness the potential within us and touch more lives than ever before. And so for me, the first part of giving hope is first to discover yourself. 
what am I passionate about? What do I want to share with other people? And um, the next one, O, is open your heart and open your mind. I don't think you can you know, bring hope to other people if you yourself are not open to new ideas. A lot of the other speakers shared about co-creation. Um, it's been there since the beginning of time. But I think somewhere along the way, we forgot about it. And it's only now, because of social media, people are um, even doing scientific work together from different universities. And you know, they're discovering a lot of new things. So first is harnessing your potential. Second is becoming open you know, to other ideas and other projects. And the next one, which I believe is very critical for P, is for perspiration. It's very important to perspire, to do what you're saying, to walk the talk. And in our project, for example, I could have just stopped with the one boat. You know, after giving those kids a boat, I could have forgotten about them. But it, it's very important that we get our hands dirty and even our feet dirty. Um, it's, I think, crucial. As one of the most companies in the world, Nike would say it, just do it. So in giving hope, you know, there's no time to think twice whether to do it or that. As long as it's the right thing to do, let's do it. So you have hop now, um, harnessing your potential, open your mind and your heart, and you have perspiration. The last part, which I think what the world really needs now, is about empowerment. We need to empower others. And I believe that's where social media and these digital tools can really help us because it's now so easy to connect with other people, with other, with, uh, not only with other people within our own countries, but you know, outside of our national boundaries. So it made me realize that hope, you know, in this time and age is very actionable. Um, as what I've shown you, it's harnessing what you're passionate about. I left my job to focus here. Because I believe, you know, we now have an opportunity to really um, solve these kinds of challenges. And next is, it allowed me to be here today. So by opening my mind and my heart to these possibilities, um, I've been to the U.S. to share this story. I've been to Singapore to, sa to share this story as well. And now I'm here in Europe. So it's, it's, it really allowed me now to see what other people in other places are doing. And it's, it's making me, you know, I'm, I used to be fatter. <laughs> but because of the perspiration, I'm now uh, thinner. And I hope that, you know, by sharing this story, I'm empowering you to also do it. You know, it could be a Montpellier funds for little kids. <laughs> it could be a TED funds for little kids or in Africa, in Asia, anywhere in the world where our help is needed. And so uh, as a final note, I'd like to invite you, having been inf infected with the yellow boat virus now, <laughs> to share it with others and also to start your own little projects that hopefully will change the world. Thank you very much.